This is University Lecture. Welcome to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, the second in a series of lectures recorded at this year's Visha activities at Iowa State. Today's speaker is Dr. Max Rafferty, author, columnist, and educator. Dr. Rafferty. I am uh, laboring under a slight technical and psychological disadvantage today because normally when I'm working either in a gymnasium or in an armory where the echoes bounce back and forth against the walls like so many ping pong balls, I generally will have an opening gambit in which I pick out a likely looking gal way in the back, a slick chick, and I will ogle my eyebrows at her like Groucho Marx and coyly inquire, can you hear me back there? Which is a particularly stupid question because if she can't hear you, she can't hear the question either. But uh, by some magical process of crowd osmosis, the word will percolate from the front ranks to the rear and she will either nod her head encouragingly or shake her head dismally, in which latter case I up the decibel level a little and all is well. But I am not doing that today because of a debacle that occurred the last time I tried it in a Los Angeles gymnasium about this size. I picked out this good-looking gal in the back and I asked, can you hear me back there? And she replied, no, no, I'm sorry, we can't. And with that, a lady got up in front, right where this young gentleman with the camera is sitting. She got up, and I thought she was never st going to stop getting up. A tremendous woman, <laughs> built like a Green Bay tackle. She got up, and she had a jaw on her like old Mussolini, you know. And she looked at me with a gaze of ill-concealed loathing. And then she turned slowly and majestically toward the back of the hall, kind of like a battleship revolving its turrets. And she looked at the little lady at the back who had said she was having difficulty hearing, and with a great air of determination, this lady up front said, well, I can hear him just fine up here, and I'll be delighted to trade places with you. So I don't ask that question anymore. If you can't hear up there, it's tough, that's all. I want to make another confession to you. I'm not here to address you as a group today, even in honor of this very special occasion you're having. I don't know how to talk to associations or cliques or herds of humanity. In fact, if I have to level with you, I don't much like groups, any groups. I'd be a washout as a political boss or a backstage manipulator of masses of human beings. But I am incorrigibly fond of John and Mary and Joe and Jane, and I'll talk to them for hours, although I hasten to add I won't inflict that upon you today. The most fun I have in life is meeting persons, not people. There's a difference there, you know. Talking with them, listening to them, getting to know them. I'm an educator, as our Master of Ceremonies has indicated, and old Socrates, the original founder and organizer of my particular union, found out a long, long time ago that the best way both to teach and to learn was to get into a conversation, a dialogue with persons. So if you don't mind, this really is not going to be either a speech or a lecture today, just a dialogue between individuals you and me. And the topic, arbitrarily selected, will be what is going to happen to us individuals anyhow. First of all, as an imaginary backdrop to this rather bare stage, let's take a look at what happened to some other residents of this planet who decided quite some time ago that 
Individualism might be okay for the birds, but certainly not for the bees. A beehive, you know, is a comfortable place. It's warm, safe, stocked with delicious food. Its inhabitants are disciplined, cooperative, seemingly happy. They labor unceasingly in highly specialized but relatively pleasant jobs for the greater good of the hive. In return, of course, they're cared for by the insect equivalent of the welfare state or the great society, from the cradle to the grave. Or perhaps it would be more accurate to say from egg to bird's craw, which is where most of them end up. They are perfectly adjusted to their environment, are the bees. They're born, they eat, they reproduce, they die. It's pretty hard for the casual observer to find any difference at all in the way most bees look and act. Such is the life of the social insect. And such it has been, oh, unvarying and relatively unchanging for about 50 million years, I guess, give or take a few million one way or the other. At just one slight disadvantage connected with this seemingly foolproof system, the disappearance of the individual. Any baby bee, I guess, which touched perhaps by some random cosmic ray, showed the slightest sign of becoming an insect Moses, Newton, or Leonardo da Vinci, would ring the alarm bells all over the hive and would alert the guardians of that elaborate structure to perform the insect equivalent of euthanasia, mercy killing upon the unfortunate little mutation. In justice to our ancient friends, the bees, it should be pointed out, too, that they would take equally drastic preventive action against any larval Hitler, Stalin, or Genghis Khan. They have thus achieved the delicate balance sought for by all advanced cultures. It's an efficient, highly developed society operating for the good of all. It's completely materialistic, absolutely egalitarian, and 100% deadly to the individual who happens to be slightly different. It has found, apparently, over the ages that the individual is just more trouble than he's worth, especially when vast population masses have to be provided for. Now, I submit that the bees, who are our seniors on this planet by a good many millions of years, have arrived at this evidently final stage of their development through the pressure of strong evolutionary forces acting upon billions and billions of individuals. It's my further contention that similar forces acting upon the rapidly multiplying hordes of our own species will tend, in the end, to produce very similar results. For good measure, and for what it may be worth to you, I'll throw in my own pet theory that too many of us educators are currently helping these evolutionary forces along to the very best of our ability, unfortunately. The individual should be, and until just a few decades ago, always had been the be-all and the end-all of my profession, education. This country was founded by individualists, some of them pretty rugged, quite a few of them a little peculiar. The schools stressed the virtues of individualism, and the churches over the years concerned themselves almost exclusively with the saving of individual souls. Not anymore. Something came along about 35 years ago, about a generation ago, which helped to change all this. It was a kind of educational nova spreading out over the summer skies, and it lighted up an entire generation with its particular type of illumination. It was called by many names. William James called it pragmatism. 
His successor and disciple, John Dewey, called it utilitarianism. His particular disciples, in their turn, called it life adjustment education, or, in its most unfortunate semantic twist, progressive education. It is the kind of education which almost all of you here, knowingly or unknowingly, have had during the days of your elementary and high school years. The great dogma of group adaptation is what I'm talking about, and it forms the cornerstone of 20th century educational theory, which all of you have been exposed to. As laid down by the disciples, the spreaders of the gospel, according to St. John Dewey, a man who paradoxically enough professed to abhor all dogma. The only eternal verity in this world is that of constant change, perpetual flux. All values are relative. All truths are mutable. All standards are variable. What's good today may be evil tomorrow, and of course vice versa. So the only thing, according to this way of thinking, which is worth teaching to young people, is the ability quickly and with facility to adjust, adjust, adjust to their environment, to be easily, comfortably, happily accepted by their peer groups. This is what the life adjustment, hierarchy, and establishment in education really believes. This is what they teach the children and what, whether you know it or not, they have taught you. And this is precisely one of the great things which is wrong with this country today. Now, let's take a look and see how the steady increase in the millions of our population, combined with this thing called progressive education's glorification of the group, always at the expense of the individual, have combined to affect two important, vocal, and highly newsworthy segments of the American people. First, and I'm sure this comes as no surprise to you, considering the nature, the nature of my audience, let's take a look at American college students. Unless you're deaf, dumb, blind, and paralyzed, I'm sure you're all familiar, probably ad infinitum and even possibly ad nauseum, with the recent demonstrations, confrontations, and perpetual unrest at the University of California at Berkeley. As one of 24 members of that university's Board of Regents, it was one of my jobs during the last decade to try to bring some kind of order out of the chaos which attached itself to that complicated and extremely thankless situation. Things, I guess, are at least temporarily in a state of uneasy balance out there. But I found long ago in working with young people that it's not enough merely to uphold authority in the name of authority and to put down threats to law and order, necessary though this certainly is, if any kind of intellectual dialogue is to be made possible on any distracted campus. It is, after all, impossible to hold any sort of debate in an atmosphere which resembles a gang rumble. It is equally impossible to have any kind of thinking prevail on one side or the other in an atmosphere which is almost completely adrenal instead of cerebral. But there was something more on, say, that Berkeley campus, with which I am personally familiar, than just the antics of the exhibitionists there, whom you saw on the boob tube every evening, and the cynical opportunism of the hardcore activist organizations which moved in after the original disturbances and took charge and sparked the more recent ones. There is, in addition, and there was all the time, a very real, if somewhat incoherent and inchoate grievance on the part of a large number of sincere and sober students with which all of us as citizens of this country should concern ourselves. 
and which you, as the future leaders of the country, had darn well better concern yourselves with if the whole structure of higher education is to survive at all. This grievance, which I noted and detected there, is loss of identity, erosion of self-respect, increasing inability to identify as an individual with a vast, impersonal institution numbering almost 30,000 souls. This student feeling may be described as a kind of creeping facelessness. At the height of the riots sparked by Mario Savio in 1965, I caught a young man on the campus, and caught was the word because I had to run after him. He was running around almost aimlessly with an IBM card pinned to his shirt front. I took him over to one side and I said, what is it you really want? He said, he was polite, he said, do you mind if I answer a question with another question? I said, no, go ahead. He said, all right, my question is this, and I do not have an answer. How the devil am I to call General Motors alma mater? To him, that was nothing but a vast machine, and he was one of the multitudinous cogs caught up in it. It is a loss of both individuality and individualism in a vast multiversity, as Clark Kerr, its president, called it then. An institution which, of necessity, has been concerning itself more and more with great problems of national research and with top-secret projects vital to the American interest. Whereas once upon a time, not too many years ago, that same institution was engaged almost exclusively in instructing young people like yourselves and in providing them with the intellectual tools which over the centuries have always been found to be indispensable in the pursuit of truth. One college undergraduate there in the more recent disturbances wrote me as follows. It was a girl, a sophomore. Quote, I'm photographed, inoculated, taped, carded, and filed. I have a library pass, a, li a parking pass, a laboratory pass, and six other passes. I sit in a lecture class with 700 others. I am number 327. The professor's lecture is piped in electronically. I never get to see him. The multiple choice tests I take are passed out automatically, corrected automatically, graded automatically, and handed back automatically. I engage in group activities, group health services, group recreation, and I presume in the fullness of time, group therapy. But this is not what I came to college for. I came here to find myself. Instead, I have become a number rather than a person." Unquote. Now, as I tell this story to audiences composed of your elders, and in some cases, I presume, your own parents, I usually pause and look for the reflex action which invariably follows. Because it's always there, like a Pavlovian reflex, a knee-jerk reflex, and it consists of this. There's a quick, unconscious look over the shoulder for George. This is no good, they say to themselves, and you are saying it to yourselves right now, and they look over their shoulder for the one responsible, for George. They're right, but there's no point looking to find the somebody responsible because the somebody is them, if I may be ungrammatical but blunt. Why should Americans be surprised at such a letter as this? What else could we expect? Didn't we permit over the years and even condone an educational way of thinking and of feeling down in our public grade and high schools, which downgraded competition in any form, which upgraded togetherness in any form, which stressed the supremacy of the group always over that of the individual, and which generally preached the overriding importance of life adjustment as compared to the importance of individual mastery of essential fundamentals of human learning. 
No wonder our colleges are being turned into huge factories. When people are conditioned from earliest childhood to believe that adjustment to their environment is the supreme goal of life, when they're taught day after endless day that acceptance by their group is far more important than the development of the individual's own God-given abilities, when they're grouped by social age down in the grades and always pass through the school with their peers in lockstep fashion, regardless of whether or not they're able to meet any reasonable standards of performance, when all these things have been going on for 35 years in the nation's schools as a whole, with some exceptions, and with our active and passive consent as Americans, well, how else can we possibly expect our colleges and universities to deal with the products of such a system of miseducation as this? They've been conditioned to conform. They've been trained to cooperate. They've been educated to adjust. And in about another generation, they should be just about ready for the hive. And they will be, too, unless we change our ways as a people. Young people like yourselves on a hundred campuses and more feel this unconsciously. It's time everybody realized it consciously. I'm not at all surprised that students a decade ago started to protest. The sad and tragic thing about it wasn't the fact of the protest, but the nature of it that and the fact that it has been of late taken over and exploited mercilessly by certain very cold-eyed and hard-boiled outfits interested in nothing about higher education except the opportunity to stir up their own personal trouble and to create their own personal version of chaos there. It may seem paradoxical that the progressive education generation of which I speak conditioned to cooperate, trained from infancy to adjust, is now rioting, demonstrating, and burning. It's no paradox at all, not really. What we are seeing on so many campuses today is the last bubbling of the yeast before it turns into those thousands upon thousands of identical loaves of bread the final flowing, restless flowing of the cement before it hardens into all those endless miles of identical concrete parking lots. It's a blind, senseless protest against the pressures leading to the death of individualism in this country. It is harmful, not helpful, destructive, not constructive, and as I have said, adrenal, not cerebral, but it is there. Here, then, is the way the trend toward the hive is affecting one element of our population. Let's turn now to another even more controversial, vocal, and newsworthy element, our racial minorities. Here I claim the privilege of every visiting fireman whom you fly in over vast distances to harangue you on these special occasions. I propose to talk briefly about myself. Although I may not look at standing up here today in my button-down collar, I happen to be a member of one of the most discriminated groups ever to immigrate to this continent. For centuries on end, my people, the Irish, had been dispossessed and jailed and starved and slaughtered in their own land by an alien and an evil usurper. A hundred years ago, more or less, after a frightful famine had killed off a large percentage of the total population of their little island, the survivors disembarked upon these shores, hungry, illiterate, ragged, diseased, unclean, and highly unwelcome. They sought bare survival here, and for two full generations that was all they found. Almost immediately across the east, the signs went up, redolent and reminiscences of signs in our own time. No Irish allowed here. No Irish need apply. We do not rent to Irish. Change that proper name, and it rings a bell in our own time, doesn't it? Business careers were closed to them. 
The learned professions were barred to them. Their accent was publicly mocked. Their customs were savagely burlesqued in cartoons and on the stage. The men were insultingly and contemptuously called micks and paddies and were allowed only to lay bricks and carry hods or a little later, of course, to leave their bones under almost every cross tie of the great Union Pacific Railroad as it fought its long, slow way westward across the continent. Their women were derisively nicknamed biddies and were grudgingly permitted to serve as laundresses, cooks, and housemaids in the homes of the rich. No band of immigrants ever had it tougher. It is true that in making any kind of analogy with the problems of the minorities today, one factor must be taken into consideration, the color factor. And this great cross they did not bear, it's true. But around their necks, like the ancient mariner's albatross, hung a cross which was greater far in that day than was any color problem. Every one of them was a member of the most despised and distrusted religion in this country today. They were papists, adherents to the Roman church, and as such, they were anathema to the power structure of the day. As I repeat, no band of immigrants ever had it tougher. And yet, within five decades, the Irish had broken out of the ghettos and had merged with the general American landscape. Irish names appeared on the roster of every profession and calling. Some of them became wealthy, more of them remained poor, but in neither case was it the result of their Irishness. Within another 50 years, one of them had become president and was martyred. How was it done? Not by any special talent or intelligence which the Irish happened to possess, not at all. It was just that they managed, after years of effort, finally to get America to treat them as individuals instead of as members of a great group. They persuaded their own children from infancy to think of themselves and their fellow Americans to think of them too as men and women, tall, short, fat, thin, homely, handsome, stupid, smart, just like the rest of us. Now mark this, and mark it well. Had the Irish been conditioned in the schools of that day as little children to think of themselves solely as members of a national or religious group, or even as members of a broader, blander, peer group, to use the execrable jargon of the day, they would have stayed in that group indefinitely, conditioned to do so. Had they been sold a bill of goods down in the grades about adjusting to environment being the main goal both of education and of life itself, they would have adjusted willingly to those dirty, cheerless ghettos and to those back-breaking, menial jobs, and they would still be working at them diligently and mindlessly today. Had they been told over the years and had it dinned into their heads, that mastery of organized and disciplined subject matter was far less important than something called democratic sharing. They would never have learned enough specific subject matter to convince their fellow Americans of their ability to get things done. And whether you realize it or not, running through the whole warp and woof of our almost insanely complex structure in this country today, like one golden thread which runs true through the entire fabric, there is this one factor which everyone shares, an instinct instinctive American respect in any field for the fellow who can get things done. Whether he is a writer or a bricklayer, whether he is an artist or a promoter or a scholar or an activist, the respect is reserved for the man who can get things done and make things happen. Had they been taught that competition was evil in itself, they would have stayed as low man on the national totem pole, kept there by those who could and did compete better than they could. I don't want any child in any school taught down in the grades to adjust to his environment. To adjust to what we see on the boob tube every night at news time, 
to what we see in the newspaper headlines every morning, to adjust to this? Is it not to come to terms with madness? We need a generation which wants to make things better, not to be conditioned in school to accept easily and comfortably and happily and brainlessly things as they are. Remember this, too. If our ancestors, those men and women who came across the thousands of leagues of trackless oceans to found this country, had they ad adopted adjustment to environment as their philosophy and that of their children, we, their descendants today, would be living still along a narrow belt of land along the Atlantic seaboard in log cabins and fighting off Indians. For this would have represented the perfect optimum adjustment to the environment which they found here. Instead, they preferred to teach their children to take their environment into their hands and mold it and shape it a little closer to their heart's desire. And in so doing, they produced this nation, which for all its faults, political, economic, and ecological, has for so long now and continues to be the wonder and the envy of the human race. And this they could never have done by persuading their descendants to adjust happily to their environment. Nor can we do it today. What I'm trying to say is that during the historical period, when these people, the Irish, were breaking out of the permanent minority group category to which they'd been lumped when they came here, our school system then was stressing basic education and the fundamentals of human learning, the dignity of the individual over and above that of any clique or sect, and above all, the importance of organized discipline and systematic mastery of subject matter to each, by each pupil to the very limit of his own ability and to the extent to which his own mind could be stretched. During this same period of time, the black American and the Mexican American Presently, our greatest ethnic minorities in my old state, the latter far outnumber the former. These people were in most states, and in most cases, not getting any education at all. In more recent years, under universal compulsory education, they began, for the first time, to be enrolled in schools in large numbers. But it was during these same recent years that this life adjustment, progressive education cult took over those same schools nationwide, spreading out from Columbia University's Teachers College, and started preaching the gospel of groupism. Groupism at any cost, Groupism for the sake of groupism. Groupism is not what our racial or ethnic minorities need today. They've had too darn much of it already imposed upon them in the past. When you react to stimuli only as a member of your group, when you find your self-respect and your self-fulfillment only as a member of your group, when you vote only as a member of your group, then you're just asking to be treated according to the lowest common denominator of that same group, whatever it may be. You abdicate your right to be treated as an individual in favor of the right to be treated as just one more cog in the machine, one more faceless figure in the crowd, one more bee 
in the hive. But you're not a bee, and nobody has the right to regard you or any other American as simply one more member of a certain swarm. A century ago, my people all had the same identical accent, wore the same identical costume, and had the same identical religion. There was a great temptation as a result of this for other Americans to regard them as all alike and to label them accordingly and to deal with them in the mass. That's always the easiest way to deal with people. Instead of dealing with them as separate, living, breathing human beings, each with a different personality and with a different immortal soul. It's greatly to the credit of this country, despite the rocks thrown at the past by the present, that we have successfully overcome in past generations the temptation to fragment the nation endlessly into Irish Americans or German Americans or Polish Americans or any other kind of special Americans. Such terminology did indeed exist for a time, but happily the climate, the traditions, yes, the genius of our people have been uncongenial in the long run to most attempts to lure us onto the fatal path of hyphenated Americanism. The last two relics of this ancient era, the terms Negro American and Mexican American, yes, and Indian American, must now be subjected to the same influences which over the years wiped out the terms Irish American, German American, and all the rest. If I were a member of a current racial minority in this year, 1971, I would do these things. First of all, I would remember certainly that we are born into groups, into families, into cities, into states, into nations, and into the general group of mankind. But I would never let the group become more important to me than my own individual rights as an American. I would work with the group, but I would never let the group become the be-all and the end-all, the alter ego of my own personality. Secondly, I would remember that there are some things we go into, some because we have to, some because we want to, in which for a short time we put aside individuality and individualism for the sake of something which is even more important than that to us at the time. Military service is an example. Athletics is an example of the other. Thirdly, as a parent, I would insist upon an educational philosophy in my local schools, which emphasized the importance of the individual rather than the desirability of in-groupness, a philosophy of education which taught each child to use the wonderful, glittering, sharp-edged sword of subject matter to gain success a philosophy which took my youngster where it found him, wherever that was, and then taught him to read so well, and to spell so well, and to speak and to write English so well, that he would be superior to the graduates of other schools always as an individual, but not as a member of some group. Fourthly, as a breadwinner, I would continually upgrade my own capabilities and potentialities in the occupation of my choice by taking advantage of adult education, night school classes, college extension courses, wherever and whenever I could find them. And in this nation in the year 1971, that is almost everywhere. If I couldn't read very well, I'd take remedial reading until I could. If I spoke bad English, you can bet I'd study good English. If I needed some special skill to enable me to get a better job and to earn more money, you can bet, too, I'd find a school somewhere that offered it, and I'd sign up for it in my spare time, and I'd take it, and I'd pass it, and I'd master it if it half killed me. Fifthly, as a voter, I would join a political party which treated me as an individual, not as a member of a voting block. And if I couldn't find a major party that did it, I'd create one and help at least create one. I would support better laws for everybody knowing that in a democratic society of 201 million people, that's the only way to get a better break for me. And I would resent bitterly efforts to use me as an ethnic or national minority member in order to perpetuate any person or any party in power. I would resist with my ballot 
any attempt to discriminate against me because of my race or national background, whether by the government, by industry, or by organized labor. Here, then, is a formula for the future for whatever it's worth. Press for recognition as a person and qualify yourself to be worthy of such recognition if and when you get it. Get out from under the dead hand of uniformity. Fight against statism and groupism wherever they crop up. Be an American first and work to build a land in which the opportunity of each individual will be, will be limited only by the measure of the man himself and by the luck of the draw. This way lies equality for all and special favoritism for none. And no American can or should ask for more than this. Nothing more is really necessary, but not one bit less is going to do. And after all, in closing, let me address just a final appeal to you students who are here today. For Pete's sake, resolve among yourselves never to surrender to the greatest enemy you have in the generation which lies ahead. And it's not any of the things you've been thinking of. It's not a dying Vietnam War which will wind itself up within the next 16 months. It's not an ecology which stems from something else. It's not the H-bomb. It's not even civil rights. These things all have a major cause and stem from one common fountainhead of enmity. Your greatest enemy, surprisingly and laughably, is Mr. Stork. And you'd better believe it. Resolve among yourselves never to surrender to your greatest enemy, the sheer, blind, deadening weight of numbers. Because uniquely among all generations that have come, this is the enemy with whom at last you have come grimly to grips. And the tragic part of it is that on campus after campus where the leadership of the future should be springing up, this is the last enemy who is realized. Not so much in this country where the birth rate at least has reached a temporary trough, but in Asia, in Africa, in South America, bulging and burgeoning at the seams. In 40 years, the population of this planet will double unless something is done. Just because mankind, however, is breeding in a terrific explosion of population, don't sit back in your several little groups and wait numbly and happily for inevitable tragedy to overtake you. It may well be that the great contribution which your America has yet to make in its cycle of universal history will be the solution to this one crucial problem, the survival of the individual, precious and unique, in a world of constantly multiplying billions. Surely in the hammering out of a mighty issue such as this one, there's a vital role for each American to play. College student or racial minority member, educator or non-educator, businessman or trade unionist, a role which each of us must act out and hopefully add to until the time comes for us to leave the stage to those who will come after us and will inherit what we leave them. For tomorrow will come in one way or another. Make no mistake about it. It has a nasty habit of doing that. Make no mistake, it's going to be up to us and particularly to you who come upon the stage as some of us are about to leave it. As individual citizens of the country, which I have said is at once the hope and the envy of the human race, to determine whether the on-surging and billowing wave of the future, mankind is going to hear the laughter and the shouting of free men or the murmuring of innumerable bees. You have been listening to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today you heard the second in a series of lectures recorded at this year's Visha Activities at Iowa State University. Today's speaker was author, columnist, and educator Dr. Max Rafferty. 
Next week at this time, we will present the question and answer period which followed Dr. Rafferty's talk. University Lecture is a presentation of Iowa State University Radio.